the panel is called um, Virtual Non-Disclosure Annoyance When Secrecy Blocks Creativity. Uh, I am Felix. I'm kind of the moderator. I don't know. Moderator is a strong word. I'm going to be guiding a conversation and I'm sure we'll go places and you'll join us. Um, my role in the industry is uh, I work, I've worked with a lot of different indie teams in biz dev, production, um, PR, that kind of thing. I, I, I've I've done a lot of games over the years and I've seen a lot of NDAs from different aspects. So corporate aspects, uh, indie aspects, um, friend DA aspects, um, and uh, they're they are tricky navigation. So um, we're gonna do quick in introductions today. I'm gonna start with um, Evan, you can go first. Um, hi, everyone watching. My name is Evan Narsis. Um, my role in the industry is I'm a narrative design consultant, which means I get called in on different projects to help um, figure out the uh, interaction between narrative and gameplay um, and storytelling, um, helping sharpening those things up. But I'm also a recovering journalist who covered the games industry for many years at places like Kotaku um, and, and Time Magazine. So I know about NDAs from both angles and um, it doesn't feel good from either angle, but we can get into that. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Um, Julia, I'll have you go next. Yeah, hi, I'm Julia Minamata. I'm a game indie game developer. I also have worked as an art director, pixel artist. I'm starting to dip my foot into some narrative consulting and some cultural sensitivity reading. So that's where uh, I'm starting to butt up against a little bit of the NDA stuff and also trying to navigate how to decide what will be NDA, what won't be on my very own project where I do have all that control and responsibility. So I'm going to be really interested in seeing how, how it is approached from the games industry side. Me personally, I actually am an ex uh, freelance illustrator. I was in the illustration, uh, editorial illustration, so newspapers and magazines for maybe 10 plus years. And I know what those contracts are like and, and what I can and can't share in terms of images and what that's kind of been restrictive in, in terms of being topical and being able to join a conversation in a visual way. And so hopefully I can share a little bit of, about that. Um, but uh, that, that's what I've been up to so far. So I'm being really interested to, to see what people have to say about this topic. Awesome. Yeah, thanks. Um, Louisa? Yeah, uh, my name is Louisa Atto. Um, I am a narrative designer um, and a writer within the games industry very recently, but I'm also a published author. Um, and that I think is where most of my experience with NDAs comes from. But it's been really interesting, I think, getting into games and also still publishing and just seeing the similarities in both, but also the grave differences that I've noticed that really kind of hamper on creativity, I think. Um, so yeah, I'm just really interested to take part and hear what everyone has to say. Awesome, very excited. Um, so many cool perspectives. Um, and lastly. Hi, I'm um, Zollery Nelson Jr. Uh, I am a creative director, designer, and writer. I've worked in over 60 games in the past six years, uh, and most of those games weren't mine. So I have this very broad uh, range of experience in terms of both wildly different production and NDA methodologies, as well as now as a, st a studio head with over 40 people, uh, understanding how I'm going to manage uh, NDAs and how the influence of NDAs within uh, and it's out, out, within and outside of groups is impacting creativity, collaboration, and our ability to be fundamentally creative humans. I feel like uh, you particularly like have sampled, you've, you've traveled, you've wandered the earth, like studying NDAs, like, oh, the Ubisoft school, okay. <laughs> hmm, they use French, right? And you can talk about it over wine, but not in the morning over coffee. Yeah, there's this really buckwild thing, especially with like, the really interesting thing is when you, uh, I, I've done a little bit of working with governments as well. And when stuff isn't under NDA, but you absolutely should not talk about it. That's also a really interesting intersection that I don't see much uh, discussion of in games because NDAs are this thing that are universal, kind of an accepted part of our contracts, even just like soft NDAs. But we neither talk about uh, what's inside of them, uh, especially to the wider uh, medium, or about their existence. Yeah. Yeah. The sheer existence of an NDA is in and of itself an NDA, which is so interesting sometimes, right? And navigating that. And, and you brought up something really interesting too, like the different etiquette 
uh, and involvement in in layers of NDA, right? And I mean, between different industries, etc. Um, I think I think so. We're going to talk a lot about that. I think today we're probably going to get into at least three different kinds of NDA, um, NDA corporate mandated NDA that has affected us in our work. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about friendies, which is the affectionate term for not having an NDA signed, but trust, a level of trust and assume trust between you and collaborators or people that you want to know about your project and how we navigate those and how they're used and abused. Um, and then basically also about breaking NDAs and understanding what that feels like when you know you've done it, when you don't know you've done it, uh, the consequences. Um, we may or may not share stories. I don't know if anyone has any uh, ready to go for the breaking part. You, you're but... trying to get me got out here, Felix. It's not going to happen. <laughs> like, but, you just want to see a but... red sniper dot right here. Yeah. <laughs> but I have uh... a child to raise. No thanks. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, everyone but you. We'll turn off your camera at least for that one. Um, we'll, we'll mask your voice for that part. Yeah, but no say we gotta do the voice mask. Yeah, I yeah want the we'll do the voice mask. Yeah, yeah. Dateline treatment. <laughs> but but I mean, I think it's important to talk about at least those three, and we'll see where we go from there. Um, because especially for people getting into the industry or navigating a new job in the industry, maybe changing positions, all of this changes no matter where you are, right? Depending on where you're positioned, um, the way you see and experience an NDA is gonna be different. So um, yeah, I guess we can start with um, talking about, you know, a lot of us here, if not all of us have worked with corporations um, as smaller indie individuals or as freelancers um in AAA and I would love to hear from any of you maybe on um whether not just NDA but secrecy right so the idea of secrecy has it affected you and your projects um across your professional career especially in terms of creativity secrecy causes anxiety you know that's the one the the, the first thing right like it it, it the open channels that you need as a creative person um, to let the world like talk to you and talk back to it, right? Like, you know, if I can resurrect the corpse of the video games being art argument, like, yeah, they are. Video games are art and they're, and art is a conversation between the artist and the world, right? So like uh, when you're working collaboratively as you must in a, in a medium like video games, like, the need for secrecy is totally understandable, right? Like we can talk about market advantage. We could talk about, you know, creative control and stuff like that. But like what, what NDAs and the kind of attendant secrecy that, that, that comes with them do is they hermetically seal you and a team and collaborators in a bubble, right? So it's like, it limits the way you can react to the world and the, the kind of like filters that you set up to kind of, hey, this is something in the world that's happening that matters and I want to talk about it. But like you, you double clutch at invoking like these elements in the real world, right? You know, it, it's, for me, it makes me very, very anxious because I tend to be a very open book person. I talk about, you know, like my feelings and thoughts pretty freely. So when I'm engaged in projects where I can't do that, like, it feels like there's this onus to trust your own instincts in a way that is really heavy. Um, but at the same time, it's like, well, the way I learned to trust my instincts is having conversations with people in the world and figuring out, oh, okay, how, what do I think about such a thing? Or is this a good idea or not? And the simple fact of the matter is, you can't ask that question to like, your team, your friends, because you're NDA'd, right? So like, it, it creates this like performance anxiety that is really, really, like I said, onerous because you're like, I don't know if this is good or not, but I'm gonna throw it out there because the means I, I usually have to test an idea like are not available to me. I really like the, the use of the word performance in particular because so much of NDA is also within the industry, especially if you're in a industry heavy context, like say a GDC, feel deeply performative people just talk about stuff uh especially if they're higher up or c-suite or whatever else they may be dropping stuff in hallways you're like that should you be like talking about right, that in public right, right but the selective secrecy when in when someone is allowed to talk about something when they aren't 
uh, what information may be shared with you as a team member. I've had projects release multiple times and I didn't know that they came out uh, and I perhaps even played a pivotal role on them as part of the team. Uh, the idea that we are operating always in this gray space for the performance of an NDA because different partners have fundamentally different priorities with how they handle this practice. And as Evan mentioned, the need for secrecy adds a whole lot of additional anxiety to this because especially if you're a marginalized person, something that is totally fine for even maybe other members of the team and you get placed as the person who broke an NDA, you get placed as the person who uh, has violated the etiquette that is inconsistently applied it's something that I have seen, especially for people who are earlier career in this industry, be deeply shattering and also keep them from learning about, are they being exploited? Is this a good working environment? Is this normal? Am I crazy? Am I crazy? Is this normal? Um, I Two things I've thought in the past, absolutely, when it comes to secrecy. And just the sense of isolation in those moments. Like to me, Evan, something that you mentioned as well is like creativity and isolation are for, for a lot of people, at least for me, are at, at odds with each other. I am a socially creative person. I thrive on creative collaboration and the isolation or at least the fear of consequence if you don't isolate is something that NDAs are designed to instill in you, right? Especially, and it's salt in the wound when, like you said, Zalavir, when you see like, or hear someone who is either has power, more power than you at the company or more power in the structure, just flippantly breaking said NDA, right? And you know, it doesn't apply to you. You know, in that moment, right? It is a, it is a flex. It is such a flex and, and makes you feel even more isolated in that moment, which I can't imagine from a creative standpoint can be healthy for games, not just us. Yes, anxiety, we as individuals, but also the industry, I think, suffers from this in terms of um, output and, and um, innovation in general, right? And I, the pressure to always be innovative, but, the, but also the pressure to always be isolated just does not seem like a path forward. It really doesn't. Um, yeah, from, from both um, Luisa and, and Julia, like your experiences in slightly different areas of the industry, mm -hmm. like talk to me a little bit about that too, um, especially off the, off, from the writing side. I want to know if this is the same there. I have to, yeah. Oh man, I want to say that like coming into games, it feels a little bit like whiplash, just like learning about the intensity of the NDAs that we have here. And I will say more to like Evan and Zalavir's point, like if somebody is leaking secrets and they're higher up, but people who are actually... I would say arguably like doing a lot of the creative work or like the writing work and that sort of thing, being made to feel like they cannot say anything um, must be incredibly stifling. Like I just, I cannot imagine what that would be like being like, you know, a staff writer and having someone higher up leaking something that you're working on, but knowing that you can't, I, I don't know. Um, but I think in terms of my experience with um, just like publishing and then with games, I think the biggest difference that I have found is that um, writing books can be very solitary, although like you do have an editorial team and you can have like critique partners and all these sorts of people. Um, but if you wanted to write a book from start to finish on your own, you could. Whereas mm. with games, it really does seem like you need people. And so it is bizarre to me that the NDAs most times that I've at least come across so far um, within games are much more strict than they are in publishing. Um, yeah, I think that's kind of just even hearing um, everyone speak so far and then just with my experience in the industry so far, just really feeling like it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And I and I wonder if like, I don't know, people who work and it's just them and like a few people working in um, like at a studio and they're the only writers not having anyone to kind of bounce ideas off of um, sounds very stressful, honestly. Yes. Um, speaking of stress, uh, something that Evan said that did stand out to me that I did want to expand a bit on was that idea of uh, restriction of expression. 
and that 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 is something I did come upon in my freelance illustration career. And standard standard contract stuff in editorial um, news and news and um, newspapers and magazines would be something like, okay, well, they have first publication rights, of course, that makes sense because they they pay you to make the image, so so this is this is what they're going to use, and then they get ninety days exclusivity, so you know you don't get to really post it up socially or share it or anything like that. But the but the problem with that, especially if if it's something so editorial and so topical, is if it's a topic that you know it's it's only really really relevant for a certain amount of time, like an election or a sporting event, like the Olympics or something. And if you created this image that is you know extremely specific to that event and specific to that article, and you feel like you can't share it on your you know portfolio site or anything like that, you kind of lose traction. You lose being part of that conversation with with something that you've created. And then also what happens is, yeah, I can put this in my portfolio like three months after it's been published or something, then you kind of forget about it and you move on to other things and just kind of, you know, it kind of, um, you, you lose that immediacy of being able to say, oh, this is, this is, this is something, then let's discuss this and this is why I did this a certain way. And, that, and that's been mostly what my experience has been with, with that, I, that a corporate level of, of being restrictive in terms of what, what I can share. My, my game dev uh, experience has actually been really different because I came at it not from AAA and not from that real corporate side. My main my main project that I'm working on right now is is my own, which is really fortunate. And so I, I mentioned I'm trying to navigate how to you know this friend DNA thing. I'm going to be really interested in us talking about because I'm trying to like see what is out there in terms of practices and everything, and seeing what works for me or what makes sense to me and what doesn't. Because for me, it's really been liberating compared to it's it, like Louisa said in, in in the publishing world, not even that strict as as what I see in the games industry. But for me, it's been more liberating because I'm in control of those things and I'm responsible for those things. But at the same time, the the, the particular type of game that I'm making, um, first of all, it's a very small scale. It's an adventure game, and adventure games tend to have smaller teams. It's basically just me and a musician I've contracted, and so I have that luxury of not not needing as much now but of course feedback i'll need i'll need help with testing and stuff but i i can be a small team and and that's not the part that's difficult the part that's difficult is um that isolation i think and also the fact that it's a narrative game and so the idea being it's a story and i can't share so much about what's happening with the story because that's all that it is and so I have to be, even though it's, there's no one telling me what I can and can't share, I have to be super careful about what I'm sharing because I, I can't, I don't want to sell myself short in terms of when the game does launch. I don't want people to know everything about it. And so that's kind of difficult to navigate to. I think that's so interesting. Just um, the fact that it's from traditionally, it sounds like NDAs are more like an external um, pressure. <laughs> and then this seems like it's very internal and just trying to navigate that. That's really, it's really interesting. You know, one of the things that, again is creates such a chilling effect is like you know this is gonna sound like all existential but like how do we embody our jobs right so like it, the example i'm specifically talking about is you know there's a project i'm wor are working on a big triple a project and it's like oh when are you gonna announce it i don't know like me personally as evan i don't know it gets announced like oh then there's a leather layer can i can i say i'm working on it and and you wait for that answer and then if you can there's still yet another layer of like secrecy um i was trying to find another word but it's just it's like no secrets um you know so it's like oh okay let's say for example uh i'm working on something that's based on a comic book property uh i can't tweet about my favorite comics because oh people might you know the realization that people sift for clues and this could you know violates the NBA in some kind of arcane way that I don't even necessarily know about. Like, again, these are all chilling effects that like, to me, stifle, like, the way I want to like, be working, you know, where I'm like, absorbing and reacting and creating, or responding, or just like, taking stuff in to help feed the, the engine. Like, it, it, to me, it's like, uh, it's this cruft, it's like this dryer lint that gets in the way of like the sunlight coming through the window. I, that's a terrible metaphor. <laughs> I'm still a writer getting paid for words. So take that. I, I, I really, again, I, I really like this point about how, about the audience that secrecy is directed towards, uh, because you don't know if your personal expression, because people are trying to filter through that for clues, 
can end up in an arcane breaking of NDAs. The NDAs cover, hey, don't share anything about the game, uh, don't share anything about the project or, the, or maybe even the studio, uh, but they don't share how that's being applied and how that can be extrapolated. And because you don't know those factors that add stress, that adds anxiety, and it creates this unhealthy internal feedback loop of how I mean, can I, I, I... I'm, I'm shook that being on this panel is bringing on NDA. I know, right? The, and, and that's where, ooh, that's, that's one area where I'm, I'm really fascinated by uh, when I made the initial jump from journalism myself to uh, development, I was fascinated by how much NDAs within the industry seem to have a specific direction. And that direction is towards audience. There's so many situations in which your employer may not care uh, about you speaking with other uh, members of the industry on a discrete level, non-competitors, all this other different stuff about the fact that you worked on a thing, even to get additional work. But the area in which this gets really, uh, in which this, I do see this pretty universally applied is, but don't tell the public shit. I was the one who broke the profanity barrier. Sorry. Uh, with Free that, for all now. With that well, in we can mind, only get like a few left, yeah. <laughs> with, with that in mind, I think, uh, yeah, what it ends up producing and something that I've been very passionate about and even considering how to impact with my own studio is that internally you find community with a lot of other developers because this is, creates this circle of trust, uh, which leads to an isolation if you even consider moving into a different industry or being a different type of person or having less uh, of a unhealthy focus on your work. And additionally, our audience continually over time has an atrophying ability to speak the same language as their creators That's or right. understand our concerns or have empathy towards us. So we're seeing this increasingly vicious public storm of discussion and language towards creators while simultaneously uh, those inside the walls uh, are looking out and saying, I can't even share the beginning tools for you to begin to have a productive conversation with me and to appreciate the things you love even more. You know, Salavir, it's funny you say that because as you were talking, it reminded me of the recent discourse about reusing animations. I forget which game, you know, and it's like- Horizon. Right, so it's like, we can't talk about how games are made, which means there's, there's uh, that, that alone creates an expectation in the audience um, about the work, right? Like, well, it's all fresh. It's fresh anims all the way down, right? It's like, no, like that would be inhumane. Then we get to the, the, the humanity and inhumanity of the business practices of the medium, right? So like, if we can't talk about any of it, then like, how's it gonna get better? Like one in like a materially, like, you know, from a labor centric perspective, like how's that gonna get better? But then from the actual like craft of it all, how's that gonna get better too? If we can't talk amongst ourselves, if we're afraid to talk amongst, ourse amongst ourselves, like how is the medium collectively gonna elevate, you know, its output? Like, but these things never get discussed, except on this panel. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's oh, I'm glad we are. I, it's incredible too, to hear both of you pinpoint, uh, all of us pinpoint this like vicious cycle, right? Where the reason that the NDAs exist, especially on this corporate level is audience and audience is looking for clues because there's so much secrecy, which leads to us as creators not being able to express ourselves to any public forum. However, we all rely on social media to be known uh, in our industry to get more work. And it is this wild thing where you can't post a thing you're interested in at all, just in case someone might assume that it's related to something they know you might be working on, right? Like that is this, like this sense of, the, and the and the the protection that the bigger company has in that moment that we are not afforded, right? We say an, us behind a wall, but that wall is like, we are the wall, right? That like, essentially we're being told that we need to stand there as a barrier to protect the IP behind us and simultaneously be visible to an audience so that we can develop a relationship with them. And for some reason it's on us to manage that 100%, right? 
right? And and we get blamed for it when it when it happens. So we're taking all the flack. And I think that again, on, from a creative perspective, this is not just you've nailed it. Not just stifling personally, but how does the how does the industry move forward from that? How do we find a way to reinforce? the protections and the creativity both simultaneously. And the answer is not with secrecy the way that we've been handling it, right? I mean, it, it can't be. And you know, it, on top of all of that, you have to remember and consider human nature, right? Leaks happen, rumors happen, right? Like people talk, you know? And again, having been a journalist covering video games, like it was my job to chase down leaks and rumors, find out what's true, what's not. Like, and again, having the truth out um, ultimately is like a greater good, I th- feel like. But, and, and even when you have a source or a developer who, who also believes that, they, they are, their, their hands are tied as to like what they can talk about because these NDAs, you know? So it's like, is it working conditions? Is it the fact that the mere fact that a project exists? It's like, you know, I think there are some levels of secrecy that are absolutely absurd, you know? Like even, even as I simultaneously understand them, but it's like, Oh, okay, this thing exists. Like, oh, a new Star Wars game? I'm not working on a Star Wars game. Spoiler. I even know if I should say that. Jesus, I'm so scared. Um, no, but but like, it's like, of course, Star Wars is the billion dollars industry. Somebody somewhere is going to make a Star Wars game. You know, like, you know, it, are we going to act shocked about like, you know, the, especially these massive IP factories that they continue to turn out stuff? No, we shouldn't be. But like, again, the culture is such that. It, it, you can't talk about the sky being blue today because I don't know, this is a very specific shade of blue that we developed in house and you kind of, mm. and I, well, oh, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, we're in a really unique position, the people on this panel to talk about NDAs from a very particular perspective is that we have personally occupied the position of being the wall in a lot of different contexts. And what this, and this has a twofold effect. The first is, it means that we are incredibly valuable in the, the sense that we have built craft and we have built experience with methodology, with a wide variety of collaborators, communication styles, et cetera. It also means that if any of us get burnt out, a giant source of knowledge for the industry as a whole is lost. That That's just a gaping hole in the wall that's gone forever because uh, in the absence of institutionally distributed and culturally distributed knowledge. Uh, All you have is people who in their heads carry the lived experience and working experience to solve problems who one day, because they get exploited by a company, just that extra little bit too far, the feather on the camel's back. Now, uh, because everything is like our proprietary shade of blue in house, We've all seen companies do fix the exact same problems in both wildly divergent and deeply similar ways that we can't talk about or share and we can't get on the same page and just have that out of the way so we can do other actually interesting, innovative problem solving because we're stuck making the wheel 700 times with our in-house engine, wheel engine four. Wheel engine four. I just want to say that's like a very great way to describe it. Like I was like, wow, like I'm really getting the image in my mind of like the wheel and and like like, multiple people. Yeah. One of the things, video games is such a like ornery, like multivalent industry. Like, you know, to pick it back on your point, uh, like we can't even talk about like, oh, the button layouts on the controller, right? Like, you know, there's no standardization, you know, and yeah, specific designs have specific needs, but sometimes those, the, like you said, the, the need may have been met somewhere else, you know, mm-hmm. like, and, and you can't even talk about that. And, and it, 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 I think it creates, it makes things more, it creates more of an incline when it comes to like the creativity of certain projects. Like when, when I was on my first project, I was like, oh, okay, this is the way video games get made. Second project, it's like, oh, this is another way video games get made in third and fourth, you know? So it's like, yeah. And, and, and places like, you know, conferences like GDC and not to call them out, but like they monopolize the spaces, the opportunities to talk about craft because we're all so scared that um, 
if we talk about it independently on our own, like for whatever reason, that there's going to be severe repercussions. And I just think that's, you know, you can have Spike Lee and Robert Rodriguez, who are both filmmakers, talking about how they make their films, you know, while they're in process, you know, um, or on the run up to release, like, in a way, with a freedom that, you know, game makers don't enjoy, you know, like, it's a special event when, when Todd Howard talks to Hideo Kamija, you know what I'm saying? Because like, oh, we're finally getting, getting inside their heads. It's like, no, well, where, where are the young up and coming game makers supposed to get their, the, their sparks lit when it comes to craft, you know, like, if we can't talk about anything. Well, and it's so, it's so, it's not just at the like, you know, Todd Howard level or the AAA level, right? Like, I think, I think this applies in this really subtle and scary way to, in, like you're saying, individuals and the up and coming and those who are making their own games. Like Julie, you were talking about earlier, the idea that it's not just an NDA that that exists, you know, there's not just NDAs, it's this idea of secrecy because the more you give of your game, the less people are going to crave because there's 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 a level of secrecy that is expected now from our audiences that if you don't have it, you're not excited, right? And that is part of the toxicity of the thing you're talking about, Evan, which is like, we have created this entire economy based on secrecy and the importance of secrecy in order to have an appealing product and to reach an audience. And that doesn't make any sense when you think about it. Like there's no, there's nothing behind that that is sustainable whatsoever, not just from our perspective as that wall of knowledge and, and not just from a sense of like community sharing problem solving, but from uh, an, an economy of attention and relationship with an audience, an audience will eventually burn out on or crave so much secrecy or so much like hype that you cannot deliver on it. It is impossible to deliver on it at a certain level, right? I mean, I would argue that cyberpunk is a great example of this and that there is like, there is a level of hype and secrecy and then forced silence on the behalf of those who suffered the consequences of it that you have multiple news stories going after, you know, revolving afterwards, but but no sense of payoff or learning. Like at the end of the day, what did we actually learn, right? And not just as an audience, but as solo creators, as creators on teams, as leaders, leaders. Did, was there anything learned? And the answer, sadly, in my opinion, a lot of the time is that's how games are. We kind of sit there and go, oh my God, it happened again. And we become you know, we hopefully can take action in our own lives to work around it, but there's no movement in the industry. In it my, reinforces in my the status quo. Right, exactly. And and what does that do for people, you know, marginalized creators? What does that do for people who are in those isolated scenarios that we were talking about at the very beginning, who are at a company and feel isolated in the moment and cannot escape that? What does it do for the people who are carrying entire projects on their backs, right? It only exacerbates this entire thing. And I think maybe secrecy and NDAs aren't the root of this problem, but the idea that they contribute to it in a very big way is something that, you know, and, and this is where I want to lead into a little bit of subversion, like how we subvert that in our daily lives as creators, as people who are that wall, as people who carry those projects, as people who feel isolated, you know, friendies are part of this, right? I will say that I think friendies and different ways of subverting the toxic uh, levels of secrecy is something that I would love for all of you to speak on. I, I you know, if you've got feelings on it, it wasn't wasn't a good prompt. I mean, go. no, but like what, one one of my thoughts coming off of that prompt, Felix, is like, uh, have I ever told a therapist about my work? Like, you know, like I can talk about, oh man, work is really stressful. Like, oh yeah, tell me about it. I can't. Yeah. <laughs> um, like, you know, that's not a good therapy session for me, you know? Um, but also, you know, the subversion thing is, I think, deeply important, but also so fraught, you know, because again, you, if you step wrong, your career can be screwed, you know? Um, but like, kind of like you said before, Felix, like, I'm, 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 I tend to be socially creative too. Like my default creative mode is collaboration, right? Like I like bouncing uh, I, uh, stuff off people, you know, I don't work well in a vacuum. And 
you know, just building a team of people that you can come to and trust, you know, it's, it's like this open secret, right? Like, you know, everybody has friend DAs, right? Like that small circle, but um, it, it feels like a real act of resistance to even utter the word sometimes, you know, but like, you need to feel supported as a creator. You need to feel like um, you have people you can trust and lean on. And um, like I said, it's very, very fraught, but like the times when I've been able to do that, like I have felt very freeing, you know? Like I, 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 I remember, I mean, I'll just say it, screw it. Like, you know, I, I worked in the Miles Morales game and, you know, told us like few people that I was doing it and like, the conversations that I had about my work in the project helped clarify and strengthen my contributions to it, you know? And like, especially when you're an outside contractor like me or, or sometimes uh, uh, Zalavier has, has, has been like, when you're an outside contractor, you're not working with the team every day. You're not all kind of, you're not in the collaborative like family working on a project, right? So like I'm out here, all by myself in Austin, Texas, when everybody else is in Burbank and like, uh, well, what's going on? I don't know. I don't have, I can't avail myself of like the collective as a resource. So like, what is my collective? Who do I, you know, who do I turn to, to, to be able to, to just my, my instincts correct? Am I, am I going down the right path here? And so I feel like those, those communities that we have to form small, tight, secretive in their own way, like are so important. And I, th I think this uh, does create the environment for genuinely uh, harmful uh, lack of community. Uh, harmful lack of community and in particular, lack of uh, establishment for better working conditions. Uh, a key piece of being a full and creative and growing uh, human being is being able to talk, for example, about craft as uh, Felix touched on, but none of those tools are available to you uh, when you come to one of my most frustrating contract terms. Whenever I see it, I get so upset. What you sign over in terms of even your work for hire, not even your NDA, but just like work for hire is uh, one of the terms is, I believe, uh, working methods. Or, worked, uh, or work experience. And first off, this isn't severance. I can't just pull that out of my head. So how are we even covering that? And second, uh, following the train of thought for that NDA, even having worked on something, even having shipped something and still not being able to share with other clients, here's, here's how, how we, we solve this, this yeah. problem, creates an environment for us to stumble into the same things over and over again. Um, so now as a person who... I am, I have NDA clauses in my thing because it's an industry standard. For example, I work with Julia. Julia is one of the best contractors I've ever worked with. Uh, and anyone that Julia tells about either her work or her, uh, or her methodologies or wherever she brings that implicitly because of my goals for strange scaffold uh, and explicitly Julia, you're free to chat about that stuff. And I trust that you will not uh, do something that jeopardizes the project, but will also reach out to the resources that make you full and whole. Uh, in this position, am now left with the quiet knowledge of like, am I trusted? Am I able to be full and whole and fulfill the letter of the law? because that's genuinely meaningful to me. And I want to ensure the best protection for the people who have entrusted me and are paying my bills. You know, I know other narrative designers and I'm afraid to even say I know them, you know? <laughs> like, it's like, oh, okay, because are people gonna assume we're talking about our, our project? It's like, you know, I mean, uh, uh, Louisa, I'd be interested to hear like the compare and contrast for you with other authors, right? Like, you know, you're blocked on a character, you're figuring out their motivation, the backstory. You can presumably have those conversations with other writers, right? If you're working, even if you're working on similar projects, but like now in video game land, it's like, uh-uh-uh, don't be talking to them other writers. I'm watching you, young lady. 
Yeah, it's honestly, I, I want to say that I feel very fortunate being able to work with Sweet Baby just because we already have that kind of internal structure where it's like there's a lot of us and we're all working on different projects and because we're all kind of covered by the same NDA, we're allowed to kind of bounce ideas off one another. Um, but I recognize that that's just not the case in many places. And I cannot imagine what it would be like to not have that other view or that other perspective when I'm kind of stuck somewhere or working on something. Um, because to me, that's kind of what I experience when I'm writing books or whatever. Like if I get stuck anywhere, there there is nothing in my contract that says I'm not allowed to like tell someone. Like all of my author friends know exactly what I'm working on. Like it's just kind of very free flowing. Um, and so to go from that and then go into this world where once again, like very fortunate and sweet baby, but like outside of that, it seems very restrictive. Like just um, Evan, like as you were saying before, it's like on Twitter or just online, like, can you even say like, I like this thing? Because then people will assume that like you're working or like that there's some sort of affiliation and it's like the stress and anxiety associated with that. Um, it's just a lot, I guess I, it's, so it's really jarring, I think, to see just how different it can be and how stifling it can be for so many creatives, I think. Julia, you've been developing your game in a sort of public manner mm -hmm. for a while uh, with the Crimson Diamond. Have you found, uh, just speaking from my own experience, like pitch pitching publishers and press, have you found it difficult to, speaking of Felix's uh, very, very necessary point of the attention economy, have you found that the longer you talk about this in even a healthy way publicly, the more it reduces that sort of attention economy secrecy uh, coin. It's, it is difficult. It's really tough to balance. Am I sharing too much? Am I not sharing enough? Am I going to have enough interest in this when it does eventually launch? Because it, it is a long-term project for me because I do take on other types of work here and there and take other types of contracts on because uh, they can help me pay the bills and everything when this is a long-term project that is self-funded. I don't really have a publisher for it. And so I have to think about other ways I can be in the industry and find these other places I can operate. Um, so it, it, it can be really tricky, but um, finding, and also because it's a mystery story that I'm working on. So yeah, you definitely don't want to reveal a lot of that information related to the story because that's what basically the whole, the whole gist of the whole appeal of it. Uh, but I do, I do stream on Twitch uh, once a week. And I mentioned I do art, I, I'll do art for the game and my musician and I will collaborate and we'll do music on the game live on a live stream. And, and so what we're, we're careful about what we do and what we don't do on stream, but the actual collaborative, it's actually a collaborative process that's really nice because if viewers will will have feedback and say, oh, suggest things that we might want to try with the music or even with the art I had to stream the other night. And what I'm doing is I'm just upgrading the introductory sequence art that's already in the demo. I'm not working on like, I'm actually working on chapter five of the game right now, but I, I'm not showing any of that. I'm not discussing any of that. So I'll go work on that first on my own privately. And then I'll come in publicly and I'll stream some art that they've kind of seen already, but now we're doing a, an updated version. So, so that's, it's, it's good for that because they are seeing something sort of new, but at the same time, I'm very aware of the fact that there's only so much of that material I'm going to have before I do run out of things. And it's actually a concern because, you know, my, my musician, Dan says, well, okay, well, we, we really enjoy streaming. We stream once a week, but when the game is finished, what are we going to do? Are we going to, what do we have to share now? Because after that point, I mean, I do plan on making more games, but after that point, I have other stuff that I'm working on that I can't can't necessarily discuss or show the process of, and and speaking of you know um, the the writing aspect or the narrative consulting aspect or the cultural sensitivity reading aspect, there there are things that I'd be really proud of sharing and talking about how we solve certain problems using the material that was available to us, but we can't do that. And so I'm kind of wondering what it will look like going forward for me when I don't have my own project that I do have complete control over and have to kind of. Um, spread my attention out on other places where I have to take responsibility for certain parts and not say things or be even more careful because it's not just my own my own decisions affecting that. It's bringing up the sensitivity and like the the cultural and, and consultation in general right this is one where I find um, I find it very difficult to explain to people outside the industry that NDAs in that moment are um, in place to uh, protect f fragile egos a lot of the time, right? They are there so that later, if you say, if you want to use a, 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 an example project, um, 
and you talk about solving a problem or you talk about a character that needed iteration or you talk about some solution that you poured your life experience and soul into to help with, um, it is possible that the industry, especially coming from anyone from a marginalized background, sees that as throwing creators under the bus and sees it as you being a bad collaborator, not a good collaborator. And that's something that we should do a separate talk on because it is not this, but it is not unrelated. And it is something that we, that a lot of, I've noticed a lot of secrecy is wielded as this shield or as this um, support for, um, and, and, and as a, and as a tool to say, well, we can't share process. We can't because that would be leaking our secrets when in actual fact, it's about admitting to and helping to diversify an industry that desperately needs it and empowering those who could do that. Right. And that is not something that some people are willing to do. I'm not saying all NDAs are that, but I have encountered that a lot. Um, it's why it's why, again, I rely on friend DAs a lot of the time. And there are only certain types of people that I will exchange a friend DA with. Right. Again, friend DA, in case you're watching and, and don't know what that is, it is a, an unspoken NDA. It is a level of trust that presumably we have. I would say sometimes when we're talking about higher ups leaking or offhanded, making offhanded remarks about, you know, something that we can't, that's not a friend DA. I think that is specifically a flex. What I'm talking about is you could like what we've been talking about collaborating with trusted individuals outside of our NDA, but within the bounds of respect and, and knowledge that we're both in this together now, and that you would be screwing me over if you said something. And, and that's something that, that, when it gets broken, it's such an important subversion that when something goes wrong there, it is so fragile and so scary. And I don't yet know how to how to tell. I, I'm good at just knowing when someone can be friend aid for myself, but it's different when it's a degree of separation. And I think, Julia, you were just mentioning that, is this idea that it is not my actual, it's not me on the line. Someone has come to me with something and I'm collaborating with them. And now I think this other person would be useful, but I have to make a call in that moment, whether I can extend that trust network, right? And that's where things start to get a little more fragile over time. And yeah. You know, Felix, you, you mentioned like respect and knowledge as part of the ingredients that go into like NDA versus friend DA stuff. Like, I think the other, uh, another important one is like basic common sense. Like the thing, of, the thing about like NDAs is this, and look, from, from like a legal perspective, I totally understand it. But like, from like a cultural interpersonal perspective, it's like, we don't trust you to have the goddamn common sense to know who or what to talk about, about this thing. So you just can't talk about it at all. Um, and it's uh, it's tricky because like, like Zalavar said, we're, as creators, we're asked to bring our whole beings to a project, right? All our sensibilities, our, our knowledge, our instincts and whatever. But, but this one aspect of the industry is telling you to negate those parts of yourself, right? Even when they could be helpful, right? Like, you know, I was working on a comic book project a couple of months ago and I was running lines of dialogue past my friends and I was able to do that because there's not this insanely restrictive NDA about it. But, but more, moreover, and I don't remember the exact terms of the NDA, but like I had the common sense to know that I'm talking to people who ain't gonna snitch, you know? Like, like that's the thing. And again, if you're working by yourself, um, and even if you're not, it's like being able to pull in like other things that might help you do the job is really important. I've really, I've really felt that like working mostly on mostly on my own with my own adventure game, that it's so important because yeah, that playtesting aspect, you need feedback, you lose complete sight of is this good? Is this interesting? Is is it compelling? Is it funny? Is it anything really? Because after you're you're just locked in with it on your own this whole time. But fortunately for me, um, the adventure game community is full of a lot of developers that are exactly in the same boat as I am. And so, yeah, we bounce ideas off each other. We help with the code and everything. If you're having problems, um, I use something, an, an engine called Adventure Game Studio. It's been around for 25 years. It's open source. It started out as a very non-commercial venture and they, the community to this day is still extremely supportive of 
you know, seeking out help, advice, feedback, industry stuff, every, every aspect of it. I found nothing but helpful people who have been wonderful. And I could not, I, I, I sit here now and I can tell you, I, I could not have gotten as far as I did without that community. And I feel like it could even be a matter of scale where when you get so big, you get to these trip, this AAA stuff, you have shareholders, all this gets lost. This feeling of community and personal responsibility and respect gets completely lost in that shuffle because it becomes all about money. But for the adventure game community, I feel like a lot of us, well, for instance, this, this huge piece of news came out this week about Return to Monkey Island, right? This, it's a huge news. I mean, working in secrecy for two years, these people, and it's this huge thing. And uh, for a lot of us, when we see this on Twitter, we think this is fantastic because it's raising the profile of all adventure games. Adventure games is a very tiny slice of a pie that is, is much bigger, right? And so I feel like this greater awareness is only going to help us. I don't see it as competition. I see it as, you know, that whole uh, high tide raises all boats type of situation. And that, that attitude is, it goes a long way in that trust and collaboration aspect. And when it comes to friend, friend, uh, friend DAs, it's, yeah, we, we help each you other. You can't even say it. That's how, that's how scared <laughs> they got you. <laughs> it, it really, it's so helpful because, yeah, I mean, we all have like stuff that we share with each other and it becomes this mutually beneficial arrangement where, you know, someone comes to me, I come to them or, you know, we, it just, it's, it's a wonderfully um, respectful and creative space to be in. And I'm so grateful for that. And, you know, I want to hit on a point that Zalavia and Felix both made, like in, in, a, in a, creative medium and industry is so desperately in need of diversification, you know, like for me to be walking around like a secret agent with like the fedora and the, and the, 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 the trench coat collar turned up, you know, that doesn't help the next Evan or the next Louisa or whoever, like follow in my footsteps, you know, like if I've got to like, uh, 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 you know, shovel the snow so that the footsteps can't be found in the first place, you're not going to be able to figure out how I got where I, where I am, you know? And like, yeah, there are forums where I can talk about my path, but like the actual nitty gritty day-to-day -day incremental experience of the work, like by and large, we're not able to talk about. I can't talk about how many drafts Project X went through. You know, I can't talk about tweaking the dialogue. I can't talk about mission design and stuff like that. You know, again, like as a lot of you said, even after something ships, you're like, oh, no, can I? Like, do I, you know, like, what's on the cuttering floor? You know, how do we refine this? Like, these are all craft considerations that you simply cannot talk about. And, you know, again, meanwhile, I can pick up a book uh, by Spike Lee about here's how I made this movie, you know, and you can't do that with video games. And so, again, even for these large corporate actors who say they care about diversity and inclusivity in you know in in their walled gardens whatever like well if if this culture is nda culture of secrecy persists how are you going to grow that stuff you know yeah. and there's two crucial yeah. things I'd, I'd like to go off of from there the first is just it's worth saying information that is secret is not inherently more valuable and that is reach keep going the way it is it is treated. Uh, a lot of the people who uh, I spoke to in the wake of the cyberpunk stuff, Felix, their conclusions were we need to share less instead of we need to communicate with the community more about what we're actually making. And so here we are. Uh, the second thing, moving away from that singular, very necessary point is if we're going to talk about diversification, marginalization, a critical thing I think about very often is that especially if you're a consultant, as Felix mentioned earlier, to say that you are the person that invested your heart and soul into improving an aspect of a game, into providing perspective that allowed a game to excel. The fact that there was any work to be done there at all is treated like psychologically, of course it makes sense that your uh, black character needed to be leveled up because it's gone wrong many times in the past. You, but you're, you're about to have me turn my camera off. Please <laughs> keep going, Bill. It, of course, it makes sense that your black character need to be leveled up. However, to say that you are the person who assisted with that process can put you in a really dangerous position because it makes it, it's assumed that, oh, then that meant that the team was bad. Like that was a really bad situation. And maybe it was. But if we're 
if that I've seen my friends get screwed over time and time again by being crucial to reaching a desired creative result in a collaborative medium. And then when it came to even being credited in the final game, they couldn't because to be credited is itself uh, seen as a disclosure of weakness on the part of the dev team instead of a uh, point of strength to find someone of expertise and work with them to make the project better. And if we want our games, our cultural and, uh, and our cultural situation and overall production processes to improve, the fact that you can't even be credited as a consultant sometimes, maybe oftentimes, depending on what you're consulting on, is a dire indictment of just how ridiculous our NDA culture currently is. Special thanks. For what? What'd that person do? What are you thanking them for? Special thanks for a team. Don't. They credit team <laughs> do dogs. Do not get me started. They do credit team dogs. Started. Sometimes Ooh. you don't even know what the name of the project is in the first place. Yeah. They just, there's a code name. And so you don't even know what to look for to check if your name is in the credits. You'll just be like, well, okay. I, I don't know. Maybe maybe that did something. I hope that was helpful. Because I, I have so not, you, you just kids. reminded me there's something I consulted on that I never checked to see if I got credited on. So I'm going to do that as soon as we <laughs> Did they credit the, the dogs on the team? Because that happens. <laughs> The next time we do one like this, and I would love to see if we, and we're, we're coming up on time in a minute here. The next time we do one, I would also love to bring some um, voice actors in on this kind of thing, because I they have a lot of experience in this world as well. And it is very, it is a thankless world uh, for all of us out there. But yeah, it's it's brutal. Um, or just finding out that you didn't make it. You did like hours and hours and hours and hours of works and then you, the game launches and it's someone else's voice. Like I've heard that happening and um, lots of fun stuff there. But um yeah, I think I, I would love to sort of bring this in, in closure to like a, a little bit of a how we're changing this um, mentality. I would argue that everyone here is working to um, subvert or change the way we think about secrecy in a healthy way while maintaining the you know, n necessary aspects of it. I do think there are necessary aspects of it. I think there are bad actors in the world and you want to avoid those bad actors. I think that there are um, important collaborations that need to be released at certain times. You know, there's an amount of information about your game you want to release, et cetera. Julia talked about, you know, the adventure game community. That's incredible. Luisa, you work with Sweet Baby, and I think Sweet Baby in of itself in structure is subverting this. You mentioned it where, where you don't have the isolation factor. You can, everybody's under NDA at the company. And so you can turn to each other, this like growing trusted network that, acts under a company, which for some reason, corporations are more inclined to just trust because by the way, every time a game gets made, there are whole companies that were contracted and like, in like you'll look at the end of the end of the credits at, on an any AAA game and there's like studios in Australia that did half the work and studios in whatever, Canada that did half the work and like you're, they're not the creators that were in the room at the time, they were entire companies. And those people do have a little bit of luxury to turn to each other in that moment and say like, is what is the process that is happening here? And there's a degree of separation and trust given. And I think Sweet Baby is that for indies and for um, diverse like creation, you know, narrative creation, as well as you, um, Zalavir, I think you're doing a lot of that as well with your company. And I just wanna say um, everybody here is working to to subvert it but if anyone has any thoughts on that to close this out i would love to hear it oh uh, my one first thought is a, sh a shouts to kim belair founder and ceo yeah, of the sweet kim baby uh um I, who's kind of like the person who connects us all i think um you know and again i feel like increasing the the pool of uh, diverse and marginalized people in this industry is like so important to me personally right like so it's frustrating when you're not able to talk about aspects of the job, um, like in public, right? You know, and I'm talking about craft stuff, you know, there's, there's obviously larger cultural conversations about representation um, that need to be had. But like, you know, people ask me, well, uh, what, is, what does the game script look like? Well, what game? What studio? What writer? What is it trying to accomplish? Is this a cutscene? Is this like a mission thread? Like, and you can't talk about that stuff nine times out of 10, you know, unless you've got an approved GDC panel for a studio that you work at and has been vetted, you know, like me as just like a Ronin, I can't talk about here. Well, here's how I keep my sword sharp because, you know, 
I may have to fall on my sword if I even talk about it. I've tortured that metaphor, but like, yeah, like it just, uh, you know, the connection between um, community, craft, and execution are all things that are hampered, I feel like, by, by, by secrecy culture, right? Like, and, but at the same time, all those things are how you get better, how you get in, how you maintain and retain people, and, and, and how you grow in skill. So like, I feel like we really have to interrogate the chilling effects of this kind of secrecy um, writ large, because um, all the paranoia, all the drama, like, a lot of it is really not necessary. And it, it, and actually, like I said, it has this um, chilling effect on, on the actual craft of game making. And, and you know, it's, it's, yeah, that's what I got to say. Uh, I think it's a good, you can go ahead. So we've got, we're over by a minute, but I think we can keep going a little bit. We'll see. Uh, oh, Brendan just okay. said time. So uh, thank yeah, you, Tech. Well, the one thing I will say is, uh, the mission of my my own mission as a studio head is to enable and empower the people around me to do their best work in a healthy environment to reach a singular vision. And a key piece of that is that the people inside of that organization, both inside of that organization and outside of it, can express their full selves uh, and how they contributed to projects and how they can take that into future endeavors it's a good philosophy same we should all have it thank you everyone this has uh, been very cathartic i appreciate it